In this video, we'll be looking at a type of regression called logistic regression. Now, this is a little bit different from the previous kind of regression models we've been using, because in those models, we were trying to predict some variable, which is continuous. Uh, because, for example, we were trying to predict how much a household will spend on food. That's a continuous variable. For example, you could do 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, but you can also do anything between 1,000 and 2,000. They can take any range of those values. Now, this is different because in logistic regression, the thing we're trying to predict is a discrete variable. And, and namely, it's either 0 or 1. It's either uh, some category or another category. For example, maybe it's male, female. Maybe it's passing a test versus failing a test. In this example, we're just going to go through concretely using the same example. We're going to do, we're going to try to predict whether a team, a basketball team, will win a game based on how many hours they've practiced. So our explanatory variable is still continuous. It's how many hours you practice. So that can be one hour, two hours, anything between any small interval of time. But the thing we're trying to predict now is not continuous. It's either zero or one. Zero means they lost. So for example, your W equals zero means they lost the game. W equals one means they won the game. It makes no sense to say something like W equals 0 0.5 because you can only either win or lose a game. We're going to ignore ties for now, I guess. Um, so either you win or you lose the game. Right, so how are we going to do this? Now, we still need to have some kind of continuous thing that we're predicting, but that continuous thing can no longer be whether you win or lose, because like we said, that's either zero or one. But what is continuous is the probability of winning, because probabilities take a range between zero and one, and they can be any continuous value in between. That's what we're going to go with here. So in gray, what we have here is just some notation we'll be using later on. This, small, this function p of h is, h is the number of hours a team practices, and p of h represents this. It represents the probability of winning, that is w equals 1, given the number of hours that a team practices is little h. So if a team practices little h hours, then their probability of winning is given by p of h. And this is now continuous, so we can use uh, some kind of linear prediction model on this. And we'll see how we can use these probabilities to make a decision about whether or not we think the team will win or lose the game. So now we have a few options. We're going to go through this iteratively to kind of rule out things and decide on a final uh, result so we can see where that result came from. Our first, our first uh, possibility is that maybe we're just going to do this so that we have P of H equals beta naught plus beta 1 of H. Why not? That seems very reasonable, right? So this means that we're trying to predict the probability of winning given H hours of practice uh, based on this linear function beta naught plus beta 1 H. Now this is a bad idea because this P, this P of H is what? We know it can only take values between 0 and 1. And it makes no sense if we predict it to be something less than 0 or greater than 1. And this side, this thing on the right hand side, this linear model is unbounded. That means if we put in H that goes to infinity or H that goes to negative infinity, then we're going to get uh, predictions for the probability that are going to negative infinity and infinity, right? So we don't want that because we want it to be bounded between 0 and 1. So this model, we're going to rule out. So we're going to rule this out. This is not a good model for us to use. So maybe we say, uh, okay, maybe one transformation we could do is take the log of the left-hand side. So we take natural log P of H, and now we say we're going to model this with our linear relationship, beta naught plus beta 1 H. Now let's look at this in the same way we looked at the one we just crossed out. Now ln pH takes values between what and what. So p of h takes values uh, between 0 and 1. So ln 0 is actually undefined, but that goes towards negative infinity. So this is going from negative infinity to, and if we have, if this is 1, that's maximum can be ln of 1 is 0. So this is from negative infinity to 0. So it is unbounded on the left-hand side, but it is bounded on the right-hand side by 0. And again, that's an issue because this right-hand thing right here, this linear function, is unbounded bounded on both sides. So again, we're going to have to rule this model out. Now let's go ahead and try this thing. It's going to look a bit obscure when I write it at first, but it will actually meet the conditions that we're trying to meet. So we have natural log, and we're going to have this thing inside. We're going to have p of h divided by 1 minus p of h. And we're going to say this is going to be uh, modeled by our linear relationship. Now let's see if, let's analyze it in the same way we've been analyzing the ones that we just crossed out. Now, what are these bounded between? So p of h and 1 minus p of h. If p of h is the minimum possible thing it can be, then it would be 0, and we would have 1 minus 0, so we'd have ln of 0, which is minus infinity, right? Now, if p of h is the maximum thing it can be, which is 1, we're going to have 1 over 1 minus 1 is 0, so that's going towards infinity.
So this indeed has a range from negative infinity to infinity, just as our linear function has. So we see that it's important to note now that this doesn't, by, by any means, this doesn't mean it's a correct model, that it's even a good model. All it means is that we're not setting ourselves up for failure because in the two we crossed out up here, we're setting ourselves up for failure because we're having a big range of values where this is just going to be wrong because of the boundedness of the left-hand sides. Since this left-hand side is no longer bounded and it's still including some kind of description of the P of H, which we're trying to do, we're allowed to use this linear model here and we're not guaranteed to be wrong. So we're going to go ahead and go with this model. Now what we want to do is isolate P of H. So we want to solve this for P of H. We can go through a series of steps. For example, you take E to the power of both sides to get rid of this natural law. You do some cross multiplication. But the point is, in the end, what you're going to get, uh, the model will be P of H is equal to 1 over E to the power of negative beta naught plus beta 1 H plus 1. Okay? Let's put that in a box and then analyze what this is saying. So again, how I got this thing in green right here is that we just solved for P of H in this thing in the line right above it. Now, what does this mean? Now, if we go back to what we're trying to do, this is a prediction of, remember in gray it says, the probability of winning given you've uh, practiced for H hours. Um, it's, 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 a probability, it's a prediction of that probability for any team that's practiced H hours, right? So if we plug in, we don't have beta naught and beta one yet. We'll just we'll, uh, show how to get it on the back side of this paper. But uh, let's pretend for a second we have beta naught and beta one, okay? So we have beta naught and beta one. We have them as numbers. All we have to do now is plug in H and we'll get some kind of number. And let's do a quick reality check to make sure this number is between uh, zero and one because it is a probability in the end. Right, so let's see, let's pretend beta one is positive. If it's negative, everything I'm saying will just be reversed, but let's pretend beta one is positive. Then as we let H approach infinity, then this inside part, this beta naught plus beta one H is getting really, really big towards infinity. So we take the negative of it and E to the power of negative infinity. That's going really, really, really close to zero. So we'll have one over one, so that's one. Now, what if we do the other thing? Uh, beta one is again, uh, we're gonna let it be positive for the sake of this example. If H is going towards negative, negative infinity, then this inside part becomes negative infinity. Take the negative, we get infinity. E to the power of infinity, uh, this whole denominator becomes very, very big. So this whole this whole thing right here goes to zero. So yes, it's bounded between zero and one. So now going back to that, given that we have beta naught and beta one, if we plug in different values of h, we're going to get some value between zero and one. And that's going to represent this function. It's going to model the probability that the team wins the game given they've practiced for H hours. So now what do we do with that? How do we use this probability to make a decision about whether we predict the team's going to win or not? So how we do that, how we'll end up doing that is, uh, it's a pretty simple rule really. So if we have this probability, this P of H is less than one half. So if we predict that the probability of winning is less than a half, so it's closer to zero than it is to one, then we say that we predict this team to lose. And again, the easy rule is if it's greater than or equal to half, we it's closer to one than it is to zero, so we're just simply gonna predict that they win. That's the best we can really do with this model, and that's how we're gonna categorize these games. So the last thing that remains to be done is really figure out how do we figure out what these beta naught and beta one is. How did we do it in the ordinarily squares case, or the ridge or the lasso case? Well, what we really did was we tried to minimize something. We were minimizing the sum of the square residuals or some adaptation of that. We're not gonna do that here. We're gonna do something that appeals more to the probabilities. Now let's look at this chart right here. This chart is how many uh, how many hours a team practiced here in blue, and then whether or not they won the subsequent game. So if this team practiced for four hours, and they lost the subsequent game. This team practiced for five hours, and they won the subsequent game. This team practiced only for 3.5 hours, but they still won, and so on. We have these six values. They're just made up. But we're going to use these. This is our sample. We're going to use these to derive our betas. What we're going to do is essentially this. The intuition is that we want to find the betas such that the probability of our sample sample occurring is maximized. And why we want to do that is because our sample in fact did occur. Now truthfully I made up these numbers, but when you have a real sample, these they're going to be values you actually get from the real world, that you actually observed. So since they're true, they actually observed, we want to make their probability as high as possible. So how are we going to do that? What we want to know is the probability that the first game was a loss, the second game was a win, the third game was a win, and so on. This is exactly the same information that's being uh, captured in this chart right here.
So how we're going to do that is we need to first realize that each game is independent. We're going to assume each game is independent. So one game doesn't affect the outcome of the other game, which is a very valid suggestion um, if these games are not against each other or something like that, right? So we're going to make that assumption. So given independence, we can break up this chain of probabilities into multiplication of these six probabilities. And these we have formulas for. For example, what's the probability that the first team loses their game? Well, let's look at the first team. They practice for four hours. We have a model for the probability right here in this blue box. So if we plug in 4 into this H, and remember we don't know beta naught or beta 1, so this is just an expression right now with a 4 plugged in right here, then we'll get, if we put exactly in here, we'll get the probability of them winning that game. So, But we want the probability that they lost it because we observed that they lost it. So simply we just do 1 minus this. And that's exactly what you see here. So we do dot dot dot, and the last one would be the probability that the sixth team won their game. The sixth team, if we look at them, they practice for 10 whole hours, which is a lot. Uh, well, compared to the sample, uh, they practice for 10 hours. So all we have to do is plug in 10 into our H. Remember, we don't know beta not beta 1 yet, so this is an expression. And we want the probability of victory. So we don't need to take 1 minus because this is already how this is set up. So that's exactly what's written right here. It's just plugging in a 10 right into there. So now that we do all this, this is some function, right? This is not a number yet because we don't know beta not or beta 1. So this is a function, and we're going to name it. We're going to name it. L for likelihood of, and it's a function of beta naught and beta one. And this function actually has a name, which is why I called it L. It's called the maximum likelihood function or estimator. So maybe we'll call it estimator. So we're going to call it the maximum likelihood estimator because it's we're trying to maximize this likelihood. So we want to find the beta naught and beta 1 such that this probability is maximized. And remember why we want to do that? It's because we actually observe the sample in the real world. It's something that actually happened. So we want to maximize its probability. So we don't have a closed form for this beta naught and beta 1, but we can use techniques in numerical analysis, uh, whatever, maybe computer programming to try to find the, the uh, optimal beta naught and beta 1 such that this function, this number right here, is maximized. Okay, so again, pretend we found that, we found our beta naught and beta 1, then we can plug those into here, and now we have this function purely in terms of h, and that means when we plug in any h, we're going to have a prediction function for our probability. So really what I should put here, this is a prediction function for the probability, right? So we're going to put this hat for predicted value, predicted probability. So that means given any team, we have some team that just walks in and the team tells us, oh, hey, I've been practicing for uh, six hours for this game right now. We say, okay, we'll plug your six into this H. We'll use the beta naught and beta one, which were trained. Uh, we, we got these beta naught and beta one by training on this data of six teams right here. We take the six, put it in here. And we generate some value between 0 and 1, which is their likelihood, their probability of winning that game. So you see how logistic regression is very powerful. It's, it's calculating probabilities. It's telling you how likely you are, based on similar statistics, uh, that you are to win a game, pass a test, uh, be male or female based on some stuff about you. Um, so... It, it's, it's very useful in that way. So the final note we'd make is here we have a very simplified model where we're just trying to predict whether you win or lose a game based on how many hours you've been practicing for it. Of course, there's other things that uh, teams have that really dictate whether or not they win a game. So we can also include things like the average height of each team or uh, how, how many years this team has been practicing overall. Maybe they're like a freshman team or maybe they've been practicing for many, many years well-seasoned. So it, there's many things you can put into this model. But this is just the basic logistic model uh, using one variable.